In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Lord Jesus Christ. Glory well, we're really at the end of the meeting of the Lord today. This is the last day, the leave-taking of the meeting of the Lord, which is the 88th day after we began the Nativity Fast. So here we are at the very end of the cycle, and today we pivot decisively now toward Lent as we hear the Gospel reading that begins what is in our church called the Lenten Triodion. The Lenten Triodion is a book that has hymns and readings and materials that sort of comprise the heart of the meditational <coughs> materials that we sing and hear in the church during Great Lent. And so we begin that now, even though Lent starts in uh, four weeks from now. We begin hearing the materials for Lent now, getting ready for Lent, hearing, hearing the words of the Lord to prepare our hearts for what's coming. This gospel this morning is one of the shortest parables in the entire New Testament. It's very, it's maybe five or six verses. And in these verses, we hear words that are given to us as part of this preparation this morning. The beginning of it says, the Lord spoke this parable to those who would seek to justify themselves. Those who would see themselves as right and good and perfect in the eyes of God. And so he tells the story of two men. On one hand, we meet, firstly, the Pharisee. And this Pharisee, by his own statement, has done nothing wrong. The Pharisee kept the law. He was not unjust. He was not an extortioner. He was not an adulterer. He gave tithes. He fasted twice a week. He did all those things that we're called to do. All the things that are part of the life of a good Jew, and frankly, the life of an Orthodox Christian. He does all those things. And yet he harbors a thought. I have done these things. Therefore, I am just fine. I have done these things. Therefore, I can rest. I have done these things. Therefore, I am justified. I have done these things. Therefore, there's presumption. There's arrogance. Maybe even a little bit of self-justifying anger. What about him, Lord? What about him? He prays within himself, and he says these things to God, but really to himself. And as he praises these things in his own life, he condemns his brother. And then we meet, a moment later, this poor publican, who is a traitor to Israel, who is despicable in terms of the law. He's defiled the law. He has betrayed his people. He's a predator over the house of Israel. And yet we hear God as he views this man who will not draw near to the temple, who will only beat his breast and weep and say, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. The Lord Jesus Christ says, this man, this day, goes down to his house justified rather than the other. What I want to mention this morning that's maybe different from anything I've ever said before in regard to this parable is the idea that in the Pharisee's piety, there is an anger buried deep down in it. There's a darkness that's more than just arrogance, maybe a hidden rage. There's a fantastic book I'd recommend to all of you. It's called Confession, Doorway to Forgiveness by, by Jim Forrest. He came here several years ago. I love this book. It's, I read it a couple years ago. I picked it up again this week. It is a gem. It is fantastic. It has all kinds of things, not just about confession, about Lent, about, about guarding our heart, about being honest with God. Fantastic book. I want to read a, a section here from this book. In his later life, Nikolai Gogol, the author of the comic masterpiece in Russian, Dead Souls, and some of the world's funniest short stories, he fell under the damaging influence of a priest named Father Matthew Konstantinovsky a man whose asceticism far surpassed that of most monks. Permanently fasting, this Father Matthew drank no wine and ate no meat, even on feast days. He avoided and condemned all worldly pleasures. He approved reading only the Bible, the writings of the saints and liturgical texts. He ordered Gogol to put aside his admiration for his favorite poet, Pushkin, whose gold watch had been given to him. Deny Pushkin! Father Matthew said. He was a sinner and a pagan. Though none of Father Matthew's letters survived that were written to Gogol, 
A letter he wrote to a widow who sought his blessing for remarriage gives an impression of what he might have been like. This is a quote from Father Matthew's letter. Do not trade God for the devil and the kingdom of heaven for this world. You will have one moment of pleasure here and then you'll weep forevermore. Do not enter into conflict with God. Do not marry again. You know well that the Lord himself requires that you to struggle against the flesh. Think of your death. It will be easier for you to live. If you forget death, you will forget God. If you adorn your soul here below with fasting and abstinence, it will be pure when it reaches the hereafter. You know what to do in order to calm your passions. Eat little and eat as seldomly as possible. Avoid gluttony. Give up tea. Drink cold water instead with a piece of bread. And that only when you need them. Sleep less. Speak less. Work more. Jim Forrest writes, It is not that Father Matthew's letter is completely lacking in useful advice. Fasting days and seasons have been part of the Christian life from church's first centuries. Moderation is a virtue. Gluttony is a vice. The remembrance of mortality can be life-giving if it doesn't become an obsession. It's possible there are even good reasons to counsel this particular woman against remarriage, though one has the impression that Father Matthew prefers a cold bed to a warm one. But taken as a whole, Father Matthew's voice is the voice of the Grand Inquisitor rather than the voice of Christ, a voice that resounds with condemnation rather than mercy, with rage rather than love, with fear of life rather than gratitude. For him, what the church asks of its members is not strict enough. The church's narrow way is not narrow enough. By way of contrast, Jim Forrest gives the vision of St. Sephora Masarov, who wrote to a woman in a similar situation, Give the spirit what is due to it, and the body what it needs, so the body can carry the spirit along the way. In the spiritual life, do nothing beyond your strength, but always take the middle road, for this is the royal path, and our pride is checked in that royal path. This is an incredible thing to consider this morning, as we look at the Pharisee. And we think about the image that Jim Forrest gives us of the Grand Inquisitor. Do you know the story of that? It's a wonderful short story, parable, in the broader book, The Brothers Karamazov by Dostoevsky. <coughs> and in that book, in this vignette in that book, there's a story told about, about Seville and Spain. It's a, it's a parable, right? And so uh, um, it, the, the scene begins and it shows the crowd thronging in the cathedral and there's a girl that's died, she's died, she's dead. And all of a sudden this gentle man appears. It's Jesus. And he takes her by the hand and he says, Talitha Kumi, rise little girl. And he, he calls her back to life. And people weep and they're full of joy and love. They respond to him and they listen to his words and they surround him. And in the midst of this hubbub, an old hunched figure shuffles over in his coarse ascetic monk's robe. And it's the Grand Inquisitor the cardinal of the city, who has come. He orders the arrest of Jesus, and most of the parable consists of the dialogue between the Inquisitor and the Lord. And the accusation of the Inquisitor is so shocking because religious people fall into this. He says, you gave the people freedom. You gave them You gave them, You gave gave them. them the, the ability to choose. You gave them hope. You taught them about love. You didn't give them bread. You didn't give them power. You didn't make them feel good about themselves. You just gave them these things. So they, they're always searching. They're always looking. I, I, feel their, I, I will fill their bellies. I will entertain them. I will control them. I will make them like good sheep and cattle. Whereas you just give them hope. It's this frightening vision of religion gone awry of religion as control, not the liberty of Christ, not the liberty we see as he forgives the poor um, publican this morning, but rather the stale, brittle uh, breathlessness of the Pharisee who can look at what God has done and not give thanks, but rather look at himself and say, look at my what I've done, look at what I've accomplished, look at what I do, and look what he doesn't do. And this is the beginning of our journey, brethren. 
And if we get one thing from today as we go into Lent, may we not judge our brothers. May we not look at them and condemn them. May we not rage when we can't control something. May we not rage when our piety even isn't what we want it to be. May we not be angry at God or ourselves or at the church when, when we do something and the outcome is not what we think. Because that can take us down a road that leads us to darkness and spiritual death. May God preserve us from the sin of the Pharisee, from the sin of the Grand Inquisitor. May our faith be one that is resting on the goodness and the mercy and the love for mankind of our Lord Jesus Christ, to whom belongs glory, honor, and worship, now and ever, to ages of ages. Amen. Glory to Jesus Christ. Glory to Christ.